video conference and videotaping. We are videotaping, live streaming, and we're on Facebook live. Please ask, please use the microphones to ask questions. Watch what you say. It's public domain. And uh, the live stream recordings are usually available immediately thereafter. Last but not least, do not forget about our next conference, October 5th through 6th, Southwest Valve Summit. Um, those of you who are sitting in the back, uh, I understand there are a few places left closer up. So. So come on up. Listen, um, a couple of weeks ago we talked about interventional cardiology, where it was going, and the fact that uh, in 2018 we're, uh, we're getting very specialized and we're no longer general interventional cardiologists within a subspecialty, there are sub subspecialties. So it's uh, absolutely my pleasure to introduce my former trainee, my friend and colleague, as well as my teacher, Dr. Alpesh Shah. He's a member of our interventional section, uh, grew, up, grew, grew up in Baroda, uh, and then <laughs> actually trained for a while in my hometown in Staten Island. Uh, came here in the year 2000 and uh, has been one of our coronary interventional stalwarts since then. Uh, Alpesh is our go-to guy for chronic total occlusions, something that the rest of us have had a tough time learning. So uh, we've handed that specialty over to Alpesh. And Alpesh, come on up. Tell us how it's done. Those days from Baroda, that's a long time ago. So thank you to, to my teachers, you, Dr. Reisner, Dr. Zogby, all of you. And thanks uh, for inviting me to, to do this presentation today. Uh, it's an honor. First of all, um, as I start off, I want everybody to know about our journal. So the Methodist Debeki Heart Journal, the reason I'm raising it up is because the last uh, publication we had, the last issue we had, actually we talked about this very topic. So hopefully you all have all read it, because I'm going to ask questions. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about today is coronary CTO, CTO revascularization in the search of a definitive benefit. These are my disclosures. So we'll start with some cine loops. I want to Put you guys in the cath lab and I'm going to describe three case scenarios. So this is the first case scenario. This is a 60 year old male um, who presents with dyspnea on exertion and has an abnormal treadmill stress test. So what do we see here? We clearly see two lesions. We see a lesion in the distal RCA here and then we see a lesion in the proximal LAD. So if you look at it very carefully, right there and right there. Well, that gives us options. So what are the options? Options are PCI to both the vessels, bypass surgery with a Lima to LAD and a vein graft to RCA, medical therapy with anti-anginals, minimally invasive Lima to LAD and, op and optimal medical therapy for that RCA lesion. PCI to LAD repeating a stress test to assess RCA ischemia and ischemia driven revascularization. All right, so out of all these options, it's hard to pick. There are just too many. But if I were to change this scenario a tad bit, now I give almost a similar identical presentation, same options. You got a patient with a mid LAD lesion again. But look at the RCA. The RCA is completely occluded. Thank you. This mic is on. And now this should be on. So as you can see, the second uh, in this patient, the RC is occluded. Would that change our approach to this patient? That's, that's a question. Are we going to refer him more to bypass surgery? Are we going to do two vessel stenting or not? Now, if I were to show this angiogram to Dr. Kleiman, he may say, well, where, is, where are the collateral? So I'm just going to give you a third scenario. 
I don't have a picture to show you, but the same scenario with a tight LED lesion, totally occluded RCA, and excellent left to collaterals. Well, would that change anything? Maybe we can just do a lima with a minimally invasive surgery and treat the RCA CTO with medical therapy. So we have all these options, and this is where CTO revascularization has become a pivotal conversation in choosing the right therapy for patients with such coronary artery disease. So let's start with what is CTO? CTO is a commonly encountered complex lesion which is defined as 99 to 100% blocked uh, artery for three months. And it is responsible for clinically significant decreased blood flow, what we call TME 0 or 1. We're going to talk a lot about arterial wall anatomy today. Um, so I just want to refresh everybody's memory. There are three layers, intima, media, and adventitia. CTO is where the disease consumes the entire uh, with a fibrocalcific atheroma, which is completely occlusive. It can often consume the entire intima or media, but the adventitia remains free of disease. As we think about CTOs and what's the prevalence, the Canadian CTO registry showed that when they analyze almost 15,000 patients, almost 18% or 18.2% to be precise had chronic total occlusion. However, when we looked at therapeutic options for those vessels, the occluded vessels, look what happened to those patients. 26% had bypass surgery. Medical therapy was offered to 44%, almost half of those patients. Other PCI, non-CTO PCIs were done in 27%. Only 3% of those CTOs were revascularized using PCI technique. Because CTO itself is an independent predictor of swaying towards bypass surgery. The minute an angiogram is done, as I showed you in the previous cases, one identifies a CTO, more than likely that patient is going to end up going through bypass surgery. And this is shown in a very original data from many, many years ago, where presence of CTO reduced the amount of PCI significantly. But this has changed. Barry is old data, and over the last 10, 15 years, I think this technology has advanced quite a bit. There are certain centers around the country and internationally who are really focused on CTO intervention. So let's talk about where this has started and where this has come. So entire revolution has started um, around what we call anti-grid wires. Anti-grid wires really allowed us to go through completely occluded vessels. 2004, this was a technique which was started in Japan and then became more prevalent worldwide. Then 2007, we started doing some retrograde work. 2010 was the breakthrough of what we call early anti-grade dissection re-entry, and we'll talk about that. And eventually in 2012, the hybrid CTO-PCI algorithm was implemented, which has led to a whole new level of sophistication. So I want to first talk about certain technical advancement. What has gotten us here? What has made us more successful today than we were in those Barry days, we were probably 40% successful in CTOs. I think we are doing much, much better today. So to start off uh, understanding what has brought us here, let's start with technical advancement. The first one uh, is what is a wire design? Uh, there are four components. One is a shaft. Let's see if I can show you guys. There's, there's the shaft with this core. Then there is a tip. The tip actually has a shaping ribbon on top of that what we call spring coil. And the spring coil determines the shapeability and the steerability of a wire. But also there is an inner core, and the longer the core, the stiffer the wire gets. And then this is coated with a varieties of polymers or hydrophilic coatings, which allow safer and quicker passages of those wires. This is a basic design of, an, of a wire we have used for 20, 30 years. But there's a whole new family of CTO wires, and that has really allowed us to catapult into more success. I don't know if you can see all the details, but these are the common wires, and I'll just name a few of those. Fielder XT is usually our kind of workhorse wire or go-to get started wire. It's very low tip. It doesn't have a lot of penetrative power. Pilot 200 is probably the most successful wires of all the wires we use for any grade wire escalation. Gaia is a little bit more penetrative, has a little bit more uh, stiffness to it, 
Um, Confianza is definitely one of those uh, bulky wires where we just use it to puncture a cap and then stop after that. And Scion is a wire which we use to navigate through very tiny, slippery uh, collateral vessels from the, from the septal branches. So as, as I just said, there are specific jobs for specific wires. There is no other aspect that I know in interventional cardiology where we have so many different varieties of wires with a name tag as to what they will do. And that this science continues to progress. Biomedical engineers have really helped us get better at this. So microchannels, uh, cap penetration, knuckle dissection, dissection reentry, retrograde crossing, externalization. These are all the functions we use in CTO PCIs and there is a specific wire design uh, to do each and every one of these jobs. The second technical advancement. So one is wire, second is um, what we call support catheters. So we have guides, as you all know, which allows us to deliver wires and balloons and stents. But often we find ourselves lacking in the support we get. And to do that, we have invented this device called guide liner. This is, think of it as a mother and child concept where a guide liner works as a child. It basically invaginates all the way down into the middle of an RCA or an LED, which gives us unbelievable support. So as you can imagine, to push something through, you require a lot of backup support uh, to advance those wires and stents. The third advancement are crossing catheters. Normally, when we have a CTO, you can cross with the wire, but then you cannot advance a balloon. The balloon just gets stuck, especially if it's calcific atheromas. So what there is available is what are called crossing catheters. This is in a photograph of Corsair, which is very commonly used. It has a polyurethane resin and, and tungsten um, braiding. That braiding allows that to be torqued and rotated. And as it torques and rotates, it actually advances further down into the intimal or the subintimal space. The second example I have is a catheter called Crossboss. Crossboss is almost of a similar design but one of the technical advantages is it can be advanced without a wire, and hence often it is very helpful in crossing instant CTOs, which we often have to come across. This is a quick example of how this Corsair is advanced. So as you can see, I hope you all can see, but there is a wire which is actually going through the septals from the LED side to the RCA. And to get access for a retrograde recanalization, Corsair is advanced with this torquing motions, which is kind of to and fro. We, we believe we, we optimize it by doing eight clockwise and eight counterclockwise. Uh, and as you will gradually see, this Corsair gets advanced. This would not be possible with a regular balloon. It would be impossible to advance a regular balloon through such kind of uh, uh, vessels and tortuosities. So this crossing catheters really has allowed us to take it to the next level. And once we do that, then we uh, switch it to a support wire. The fourth technical advancement, which is probably one of the finest of all, is what is called the re-entry devices. So one would think that CTO crossing will be all intimal. Well, it is not. It, more than often, it is sub-intimal. So often the challenge is getting back into the intima. And to do that, we have this balloon, uh, which is called Stingray, and it has ports on the side of it. So unlike a regular balloon, which is uh, cylindrical in shape, this is more of a flat design, and it has two ports on two other aspects, 180 degrees opposite, which allows us to probe back to the intima uh, with a special wire. The fifth advancement um, is our uh, interventional imaging. I think without learning more about the vessels and knowing how it works, it, we would have been, it would have been impossible, so we often use IVUS to assess amount of calcification, do we need to do atherectomy, and so on and so forth. Optimal uh, optical coherence tomography, or OCT, also allows for much better resolution, especially for stent implantation and ruling out thrombosis. One of the new things we are working on today, or nowadays, is imaging from our CT lab, from the CAT scans. Um, this is an example that um, we, um, have from a few weeks ago. And what you can see is there is LED which is occluded right after the diagonal branches. You can't really truly see what is happening to this LED. There is, it's completely blinded. And that's what we see in CTO world. You really can't visualize a distal vessel. So often we use contralateral injections from the right coronary artery to see septal filling.
Now you can see some, but really truly no great idea as to what we are going to be working with. So to help us with this, we get those patients to get a coronary CTA prior to that. This is the same patient. Now what you can see, the coronary CTA is basically allows us to see the vessel beyond the occlusion. So in the green, you can see the LAD. This is areocaudal view, this is aleocranial view, but you can see it really clearly in areocranial on the CT images where this is a proximal half of the LED. There's a diagonal, there's a septal, there's a mid LED, and right at a calcified spot, it is completely occluded. Then it recanalizes and reconstitutes after a second septal, and so on and so forth. If you were to get this roadmap and work on this, it would make the procedure so much more effective. So what, to help us, those patients who get those CTAs, they, they are put on the cath lab table, we do a 45 degrees LEO, 45 degrees REO, kind of gives the, uh, the coronary anatomy a GPS. And once this is calibrated, while we are on fluoro, we can actually see the lines, the green and the reds, and you can know where the wire ought to go. Now, beyond these technical advancements, there are some methodological nuances which I would like to talk about today. So the first one is what we call anti-grade wire escalation. So this is the commonest techniques we use where we go up with this, all these fancy wires we talked about. So the first one to probe is a soft tip polymer jacketed wire. It has excellent steerability, but it has poor penetration. If that doesn't work, we go to the moderately stiff tipped uh, polymer jacketed wire, which again has good steerability and has moderate penetration. Sometimes that also doesn't work and we are left with a heavy tip non-polymer jacketed. These are just make a little puncture and get out of there, switch it to another wire. It has excellent penetration, but it can easily perforate those coronary arteries. So this is an example of anti-grade wire escalation. This is the same NGO. This is just a few weeks ago, same NGO of the patient I showed you earlier where we we're gonna make a decision. And you can see this uh, RCA CTO, there's an RV branch, but there's no flow beyond it. So when we do this contralateral injection, you can actually see um, the LA, RCA filling from the LED collaterals. Um, and that gives us a little bit of a roadmap. And once we have ascertained that, we start probing the CTO from the right side with varieties of wires. We did that. Once that has been done, that patient um, gets a balloon angioplasty, and this is a final result. So this is a classic anti-grade wire escalation technique which is used very commonly only in, almost in 50% of all our CTO PCIs. The second technique is what we call subintimal tracking and reentry techniques or the STAR techniques. Now the advantage, what, what we are trying to take advantage of this very basic concept of adventitia and the differentiation from intima and media. So often we talk about those crossing catheters. More than often, they actually go between the space of media and adventitia. They are not necessarily always right here. That sounds really scary because really very close to perforating those arteries. Well, the reason that doesn't happen all the time is because this very key concept which we realize and learn that the adventitial layer on average is about three times as, as tensile than a related media or intima. So remember that. When the adventitia is so much more tough, the wire or the devices naturally ought to take a, a, a curve which is of the least resistance, which is more towards the media or intima. So based upon this, we have come up this, with this techniques called STAR. And in STAR, this was actually originally described by Dr. Colombo. We use it a lot in SFA CTO interventions in the legs. But this has been used where we can actually push a knuckle of a wire down an occluded RCA. You can see it is not in the vessel architecture, but it's dancing with the, with, with the RCA. So it's not that far off. And once that has been established with retrograde injections, this knuckle is continued to push and it tracks into the subintimal space and then eventually re-enters the intima. And that is what is called the STAR technique. The third technique is integrated wire re-entry. And this is where the stingray balloon I mentioned comes in really handy. So this is where the stingray balloon goes uh, on the side of the CTO and then with a special wire we re-enter back into the intimal space. This is a little video of how that is done. So this is a totally occluded vessel and then a wire is probed and as often with the anti-grid wire escalation techniques that wire has nowhere to go. And we can try varieties of wires but more than often it gets stuck. 
Once that has been done, we change it to this different type of a crossing catheter called CrossBoss or Corsair, and that has been pushed. Once that gets pushed with this counterclockwise and clockwise technique, it enters into the subintimal space. You advance a wire back into the uh, CrossBoss. You take that uh, crossing catheter out. Then you bring in the Stingray balloon. The Stingray balloon goes beyond our occlusion, the CTO segment. But it is still in the subintimal space. So how do we re-enter? To re-enter, this stingray balloon is turned, turned so we can look it on angiogram that is perfectly aligned, that it is not going to go the wrong place. And then we have these two ports, proximal and distal. And those ports get probed with a wire called the stingray wire, which allows us to perforate with a very, very tiny perforation of the sub of the uh, adventitial layer. And once that probing is done, and sometimes we have to try both the, both the ports to see which one is the right way, and you can decide that angiographically. But once the wire is advanced, then you're back into the intima. Once you're back into the intima, you collapse the stingray balloon, take it back out, and now you have a wire from intima to the, to the intima, and now it is just a simple intervention beyond this point. This is an example from our own cath lab of using a stingray. So what you can see here is a very old degenerative venous graft. This is a patient who had bypass surgery twice. Once was 18 years ago with a lima to LED, the lima occluded. Then about eight years ago, he had a vein graft to LED. And that vein graft has been beat up. It has gone through four, five, ten procedures. And he was referred for severe uh, LED ischemia and symptoms. So on the vein graft injections, now this, this gets a little crowded here, but you can see the native and a vein graft. You can see the vein graft filling into the LED, but there is no anti grade channel from the proximal LED. So what we started with was, again, the classical anti grade wire escalation technique, where we would go ahead and advance a wire. And the, when you advance a wire, you can see with a balloon support, it is going into the wrong channel. When we do a retrograde injection, it is really not into the right area. It is almost looks like subintimal. It, it is going in the right direction, but it's going subintimal. So once that has been done, I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there's a small stingray balloon which has been advanced into the subintimal space right here. And you'll see in the next cine loop, we would go ahead and try to advance this wire uh, through this uh, stingray balloon. But unfortunately, the first attempt, you can, uh, the wire actually goes from the distal port into the wrong uh, area. So what we would do is re reorient the stingray balloon, bring that wire back, and then try again from a different port, the proximal port. And as you can see very quickly, when that was done, this wire advanced down into the LED. So this is the advantage of using the stingray balloon. Once that has been done, this gets confirmed with a ret uh, retrograde angiography. Then it again becomes a simple PCI after that. And this is the final result. This patient has been asymptomatic for now almost three years, ever since we have done this work on him. The fourth method is what we call retrograde wire escalations, where we use the septal collaterals from left to right, right to left, we can also use epicardial collaterals, but those are very risky with very high risk of perforation. This is a classic example where you have collaterals from right to left, but most of them are epicardial. These are RV branches, and you want to be very careful probing those. The ideal would be something like this. This is a picture of collaterals going from left PDA, from the left circumflex, to try to open up a occluded osteal proximal LED. We are doing an injection through a vein graft, and on the right side, you can actually see the progress, progression of a Corsair, and we are trying to probe the proximal LED with a wire escalation techniques. It takes a little bit of an effort. It obviously is very nuanced, but you can do simultaneous injections. You can see where the path or the passage of the wire is. And once, you, once you've gotten that confidence, uh, and, and after some persistence, a little bit of patience, you can actually see that the wire will externalize back into the guide. So this is a very unique case because we are only able to, uh, only using one guide to get the wire from the left circumflex PDA up the septal collaterals and into the 
एल ए डी का आई नहीं द फिफ्थ टेक्निक इज वॉट वी कॉल रिवर्स कार्ट और रेट्रोग्रेड डिसेक्शन री एंट्री नाउ दिस इज नाउ गेटिंग वेयर वी आर गोइंग गेट मोर एंड मोर कॉम्प्लिकेटेड सो दिस इज अ सी टी ओ वेयर वी हैव गॉट एन अ वायर फ्रॉम बोथ आर सी एंड एल ए डी दे आर नक ऑल इंटू द सब इंटरमल स्पेसिस then the proximal wire brings a balloon which actually cracks that plaque in the subintimal space and with a little bit of trial and error we are able to advance that wire from the distal back and kind of uh, marries those and once that has been done this wire gets externalized and 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 gets intervened this is an example of an rca with led collaterals uh, from the, from the left to right uh, with an rc occlusion in this one we you can see the corsair come from the Uh, left side up to the proximal rca but there's a small balloon which has been brought down and this um, uh, plaque basically gets uh, ruptured followed by that there is externalization of the wire and then again um, this is followed by balloon angioplasty and stenting of the right coronary artery so varieties of methods have been developed but i think what has led to this is common approach as, especially in us where we call it the hybrid cto algorithm this says been reproduced and re uh, used at many many institutions with fairly good success so we start off always with a dual injection uh, we decide if there is a cap is prox uh, is ambiguous if there is a poor distal target uh, then we right away go to retrograde but if not and it looks very suitable then the anti grade approach is used if the lesion length is less than 20 then anti grade uh, wiring or wire escalation works really well if it is very long then re entry as i've shown Uh, works much better and there are retrograde techniques so this is a commonly used algorithm and we don't really have to try varieties of it you kind of know by by looking at the lesion now i'm going to go to the uh, third part of the conversation which is some of the misconceptions i feel like every time uh, there's a cto case uh, there's a battle uh, trying to figure out which which is which are the ideal lesions and ideal patients so first conception or misconception is that ctos are benign I could not disagree more. Um, now, CTO vessel is an independent predictor of mortality. There are not many things. L low EF is an independent predictor of mortality, but so is CTO. The 30-day mortality in patients with cardiogenic shock. If you have more than one CTO, 100%. So, if you have two vessels which are occluded, that patient is not going to make it when he ha- he or she has. an event uh, related to cardiogenic shock one cto mortality is 66% and no cto is 40% again these are cardiogenic shock patients when you find a patient with a cto but the mi is in the non cto vessel so if you got an rca cto but now the patient is coming with an lad mi those patients have a very high one year mortality rate event cto is present so as you can see cto again is an independent predictor of mortality compared to patients with non cto it it not multi vessel disease without cto so you can have multiple lesions but if they are not cto they have the same mortality but once you put a cto is a whole different ball game this is a 5 year data what about patients we followed for so many years and they have had a non culprit cto we see those patients all the time who are treated medically or versus the or the other this is a jap uh, a, a credo kyoto acute mi registry though they followed those 2000 odd patients with stemi for five more years um and when after excluding the first 30 days they found that the cto group had continuously high persistent uh, mortality uh, rates compared to non cto patients there is also a more likelihood of patients with ctos to get ventricular arrhythmias so patients who have um, have had an icd have had appropriate shocks when you check them when you monitor them patients with pre existing ctos have much more higher likelihood of appropriate shocks or events of ventricular arrhythmias which kind of tells us it doesn't say yes that's a correlation but it makes us think that g if those patients did not have those icds but that cto was an independent predictor of possibly sudden cardiac death and the last is the ctos are benign because uh, stable ischemic heart disease are uh, 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 is that important well if you are believer in the old ischemia trials the courage trials you know that the ischemic burden is correlates with uh, events especially mortality 
So it is very important to know what is the burden, the ischemic burden of that particular vessel before deciding or, or making choices. The second misconception, and this is uh, <laughs> very frequent for, uh, for the IC group because, oh, the patient has beautiful collaterals. We're going to leave it alone. There is not a single collateral. How beautiful it looks that it is as good as your na native original conduit. To the extent, so what is the normal FFR cutoff? 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you, you go and pick your number. But when you look, do FFRs in after crossing those CTOs, not a single one shows an FFR in the excess of, what is it, 0 0.5 or 0.6. So not a single one shows adequate collateralization. The third misconception that all CTOs are same, and I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on that because it's not. Um, you know, we, we, we have patients, oh, this is an easy CTO, we'll try and wire it and see what happens. Well, that's really not the case. You should be very methodological in how you assess that. So to develop that, we have this JCTO score. That includes lesion length, calcification, angulation, uh, the stump, the proximal cap, and the uh, retry attempts, so to speak. So if it's longer, you get a score of one. If it's shorter, it's zero same with calcification, same with angulation, and so on and so forth, after which you get a JCTO score. As you can imagine, if it is zero, that is considered easy, and if it is more than two, three, four, five, then it's considered very difficult uh, CTOs. Because the more difficult it gets, the more likelihood that we will use the re-entry techniques, the retrograde techniques, as you can clearly see, that when the JCTO score is very small, most of those lesions are fixable with any grade techniques, but as you go into a higher score, the techniques have to become much more aggressive and often retrograde and re-entry re techniques. Not only that, we also have much higher use of contrast as well as dye, so you have to be very careful in selecting patients for CTO PCR revascularization, because when you look at the data um, on what is happening to those patients, it's great to be successful, but it's even better not to have unnecessary complications. So to plan this, JCTS score has been validated, and we can see that whenever other advanced techniques are used, the amount of MACE, periprocedural tamponade, or perforations, emergency bypass surgery numbers go up significantly. The second idea is that not every patient is the same or not all CTOs are patients. Uh, so what we do is we got to assess those patients a little bit better. You're not going to put everybody on the table just because he, has a, he or she has an occluded, I don't know if it's he or she, by the way, but we don't know if they have uh, lesions or shortness of breath because of that. And second is you do not want to probably open up arteries which are occluded and they are going to an infarcted territory of the heart, like a non-viable myocardium. Because CTO success are not that low. It's a misconception. Expert CTO three-year data, you can see that the MACE event rates are very acceptable and so are the MI and cardiac death. TLR, which is often used by us as a failure or target lesion revascularization, is very acceptable in the first uh, year and continues to remain low in the next year two and year three in those subgroup of patients. This is another study um, out of Japan which used uh, uh, again, a drug eluting stents, and that ES group had a very low event rates of in segment restenosis of only 2%. The reason I'm showing this is because this is a mandatory nine month angiography binary stenosis. You are actually looking at those stents at nine months, and you have extremely low restenosis rates. Today, we are part of this uh, big registry called Progress CTO Registry. There are varieties of centers around, around the country uh, which participate in this. Um, and this is the way we are monitoring all our cases. Uh, it's a national effort led by uh, Dr. Brillakis, who is now in Minneapolis. Um, and these are some of the data from it. Um, we, the technical success is about 87%. The major complications rates are 3%. Uh, these are published uh, data, 0.9% mortality, 1.1% MI, 0.9% pericardiosynthesis, very low rates of other events. Most of the patients have an integrated wire escalations, um, and, and some of them are ADR as well as retrograde. Similar data is reproduced in Japanese registries, as you can see. Um, but 
success rates are often related to the operators. Um, if you say, well, what is your technical success rates in the cath lab for routine PCI? 99%, right? Well, it's not that high in CTO PCIs. But that being said and done, the more the uh, operator experience there is, you're going to have more success rates. And you will also have less of mace or, uh, or, or complications. But to achieve that, you've got to have uh, more complex, very specialized techniques. Look, CTO world is very specialized. It's not easy work, but that being said and done, once you master both these techniques, your success rates are usually in the excess of 80%, which is where we are today. What about transradials? Um, this is becoming very common. One would think that, gee, my goodness, how can you go from radials and do CTOs? No, uh, in Europe, they are doing it all the time. Usually one catheter is femoral, one is radial. But not only that, in this uh, registry, they actually almost 24% uh, 24, 24 of those patients are biradial, so left and right radial accesses for CTOs. Complications. In the open CTO registry, we showed that uh, they are very comparable, slightly higher, obviously, uh, than routine PCI, uh, but the hospital stays as well as 30 days are very comparable to routine PCIs. However, one thing which stands out, a couple of things, is the perforation rates were very high in open CTO at about 6%, and need for emergency surgery was still very low at 0.6%. Number five, con misconception. So SVG bypass is a better option. I see some of our surgeons here, so this is especially for them. So I got a few, few points to make. If CTO PCI is not a priority, because that happens all the time, oh, leave it alone, beautiful collaterals, why? Why do we insist on bypassing a CTO vessel with good collaterals during bypass surgery? Why? You send a patient doctor rule. He does not bypass that RCA. Oh my goodness, he's going to get a phone call from Dr. Zogby next morning. Why did you not bypass it? But see if it's PCI options, ah, we can watch it. Is there any additional price we pay for SVG surgery? Uh, the truth be told, there is pump time, there is, you've got a little incision in the leg. Is SVG bypass also an independent predictor of survival benefit like Lima to LEDs? We don't really know. Truly, truly don't really know. SVG, SVG patency rates, any guess? 5%, 10%, 15% failures at one year? I'll talk about that. And every CTO gets bypass when tend to surgery, right? Well, often that's the main reason why we send those patients bypass. So, Let's look at some of this data. This was published, uh, well, this was presented at TCT several years ago, and in the Syntax study, the CTO sub-study, where 266 patients were evaluated, yes, 68%. These are the patients who went through the bypass, and they were expected to get complete revascularization, but almost 30, well, 32% did not get bypassed. And for varieties of reasons, whether it's because it was not intended to treat, or was it because it was too small? That's one of the commonest reasons we find. Now, let's talk about patency rates. So there has been a lot of debate about how patent are SVGs. For years, we didn't really know a true way because SVG occlusions are silent. They are asymptomatic. Because the native conduit, the natural conduit, continues to give some blood flow to that part of the heart, so most, most SVG occlusions are asymptomatic. Well, the coronary CTA imaging technology has completely revolutionized how we think about it. So for years, when you look back into a literature, it talks about 10%, 15%, 25% SVG occlusions at one year. But this was recently uh, presented or published in JAMA, fresh like three months ago, two months ago, which basically was comparing aspirin with ticagrelor or a combination to look for SVG patency. And they did mandatory uh, one year CTA after coronary artery bypass surgery. What I would like to point out is that one year cephalous vein graft patency in just the patients on aspirin, that's what we normally do, is 76.5%. So 24% of those bypasses were occluded in the aspirin group at one year. Not only that, the seven day patency rate was 91.1%. So again, it does not come as a massive surprise for what we always been thinking about, but this confirms what we were worried about. The second idea is that SVG bypass is, is not a simple surgery. I mean, every surgery adds certain events. So, you know, you say, well, I'm just better off sending this patient with bypass. Yeah, you talk about CTO, PCI has been complex and has some risk. Well, bypass surgery is not that simple. You can have bleeding and transfusion, arrhythmias, 
atrial fibrillation, need for aliquis and anticoagulation, renal failure, on and on. So there are price a person pays for bypass surgery as well. So this is our blue collar, blue scrub collar director. This, well, that's, that's not what I was supposed to show, but that's to what he's trying to do. But this is what he has famously quoted to us many a times, and I completely agree. The most effective way to keep a saphenous vein patent is to leave it in the leg. Right, Dr. Clavin? <laughs> now, we'll come to the big part of this. Uh, I've got 15 minutes. I'm, I may have to rush through this. So I fixed this guy's RCACTO a couple of weeks ago. So you can see pre and this is post. Did I really help this person? Did I really, really help this person? Well, one thing I know for sure is there's a lot of debate about stents work. What is the value of this? These are, these are the articles we are getting. And this is what we got, get bombarded about questions. So then why not just give anti-angional therapy and not get into this debate with the press and the Wall Street and the New York Times? Well, how many anti-angionals? For how long? How much? I mean, patients have a limit of tolerance. Sure, we can make, make them stop playing the tennis and not let them do things. Sure, and, and all those beta blockers and antigenals will work, but at what cost? Because one thing for clear is that CTO PCI improves our symptoms. You know, all the PCIs I've done for what, 17 years, I've gotten more thank yous and hugs for CTO PCIs than anything else. Because for end stem, you think about it, the patient comes with chest pain, has an MI, you put in a stand, they go home the next day. CTO PCI patients are usually suffering for months, if not years, before we intervene on them. And what we can clearly see in this open CTO data is, is there is reduction of angina, physical limitation, quality of life. There's been papers published on depression improvement of that. But also what is most remarkable is dyspnea score. The rose dyspnea score is significantly improved after PCI of CTO vessels. Can we objectify that? We put them on treadmills. Forget about what the questioner talks about. Well, VO2 max improves from 16.5 to 18.4. So does slight improvement EF but clearly an improvement of NYHA as well as CCS classes. When we try to assess them by ischemia, by PET or MR, you can actually see that there is defects which completely disappear after CTO PCIs. The other way to talk about a benefit is to look for ischemia because that's one of the often the driving force. So we talked about FFR being abnormal in every patient, even with what are called beautiful looking collaterals. So this paper actually looked at both acute and chronic toroidal occlusions, but I would like you to focus a little bit on the red lines, which are the chronic toroidal occlusions. And you can clearly see that there is a significant improvement or normalization post PCI of CTOs on all those, um, uh, all those occluded arteries. Not only that, we often use ischemia and re-stratify our patients. So the CTO benefits are usually the highest when patients have higher or moderate or severe degree of ischemia and the benefits of angina or, or dyspnea improvement or quality of life improvement are seen most in patients with high risk stress testing. The third benefit is LV function. For all, we get lots of referrals from our heart failure group for patients who have been referred from outside institutions because of CTOs, heart transplant, so on and so forth. And we have clearly shown over years, and this paper supports that, that when you assess ejection fractions using MRI, that at six months, there is not only improvement in the overall ejection fraction, but segmental wall thickening is definitely improved in CTO patients, especially when they're successful. So, talk about the fourth benefit, which is, I do not know, it's up in the air, about survival. So, this is a simple RCA, and you put in a stent. Dr. Barker does a stent. Did he improve the survival of this patient? And then the next day he does this, did he improve that survival? Who knows? We don't really know. PCI has not been shown to improve survival. Should CTO PCI held to a higher standard? Is it fair? Well, to answer those questions, we try to create certain randomized control trials. There have been two which are probably reasonably well done. The first is a decision CTO which was out of Korea. Um, 800 odd patients were enrolled. They followed those patients for about three, three odd years, and the primary endpoints included MACE, uh, MI, and, and stroke. There was a high crossover rate, um, almost of 
the procedural success was very high, but when you looked at those endpoints, especially MACE, death, MI, or stroke, there was really no statistically significant difference. The quality of life metrics was also not different, which kind of came as a big surprise because in all the CTO work, symptoms always improve. The Euro CTO trial, it was designed to enroll about 100, 1,000 patients. They had to stop at 400 odd patients, and they followed those patients again for three odd years. There was a crossover rate of about 7%, there was no, again, difference in MACE, but there was an improvement in quality of life and symptoms. So why, what are the limitations? Why don't we have 10 more randomized control trials when it comes to CTO-PCI? Well, patients and physicians are biased. Most patients do not want to be randomized to something so drastic. Uh, there's a lot of excessive scrutiny. It takes a long time to enroll. Actually, EuroCTO had to be terminated at early. There's a very high crossover because patients get tired, they want to get therapy. There's timing of randomization because a lot of those studies, the randomization happens after a non-CTO PCI is done, patient symptoms are already gone, and we use um, uh, definitions based upon their enrollment characteristics. And MACE endpoint, again, going back to this very fundamental question, is MACE a fair question to ask for PCI in any form? Forget just CTO PCI. I mean, we don't ask a knee surgeon, did you save a life? You know, we want them to fix that knee so a person can run around more. So to answer, we have more information we get from our registry. So one is the expert CTO. I don't know if you can see all those things, but our contemporary US registry is Progress CTO, which is still ongoing, and I've shared some initial data on that. And Open CTO, they have finished their 1,000 patients. Again, very successful outcomes, fantastic relief of symptoms, a little higher perforation rates of 6%, but that has been, become quite important. But we can sometimes learn from indirect messaging. For example, complete versus incomplete revascularization. As I started off in my very first slide, CTO is often the main reason for incomplete revascularization. We have seen that in varieties of trials. It has been shown in syntax. So if you believe that incomplete revascularization is a predictor of long-term events such as death, MI, so on and so forth, and if CTO is the most likely responsible reasons for it, that makes a pretty good argument to do that. Because when we those fa followed those patients, this is a large registry out of uh, Britain, uh, the BCIS database, more than 13,000 patients. When those patients with CTO were followed for four odd years, they found that patients who had failed versus partial versus complete revascularization, their mortality curves were entirely different, especially for patients who had complete versus failed revascularization. So there is a lot of benefit of complete revascularization. Often the main key factor is CTO revascularization. This information is even exemplified more when patients have low EF. These are subgroup of patients who already have high mortality rates. Uh, and when you have compared those to successful versus unsuccessful uh, CTO PCIs, patients with low EF fare the worst when they have it, uh, no revascularization to, the, to those arteries. The VA card gives us some little retrospective. VA is very good at collecting data and, and, and analyzing that. It's more standardized than we give them credit for. And if you, if you look at that data, which was followed for about uh, two years, that patients who had PCIs done, CTO PCIs done, the successful P PCI had higher survival rates compared to patients who were unsuccessful. So to come to a conclusion of my presentation today, this is the way we are, we are assessing our patient. This is a fairly simple algorithm I would like to propose to you all. So first and foremost, evaluate symptoms. This is, if any a time in cardiology, it is about evaluating symptoms other than mitral regurgitation. You gotta have an appropriate patient, you gotta have an appropriate anatomy, such as angina, dyspnea. Most of the patients with CTOs have dyspnea. They have exercise intolerance. They would say, well, I can't play tennis the way I used to. The second step almost always should be assessing ischemic burden, whether it can be done by perfusion, MRI, PET. But again, I think what I use generally is that there should be more than 10% um, ischemia for us to proceed with a CTO PCI. And again, if it is less than 5% ischemic burden, consider doing medical therapy and reassess those patients on a yearly to yearly basis with those studies. And the third and obviously the most important is demonstrating viability in patients with reduced EF and that ought to be done usually I would recommend with MRI uh, because if the sub endocardial late enhancement is uh, less than 50% or there is more than 10% reversible defect, then I, I would consider doing PCI. 
I want to uh, showcase, this is actually one of our own patients, referred to by one of our, my colleagues here, someone who is very precise, so you know him. Uh, and these are his notes, I'll still on his notes from Epic. 66-year-old um, male patient with past medical history of CAD, status post tense in 98, 2003, PCI times 2 in Boston, 3-vessel cabbage in 2016. But that included a vein graft OM, or OM1, OM2, and a lima to a diagonal, not to LAD. Dyslipidemia, who presents with chest pain um, in the clinic. He has been taking nitro every day over the last two months for pain and has had no improvements in shortness of breath, dyspnea, or chest pain. So what do we see here? We actually can see a totally occluded LAD. And this patient, again, has no lima to LED. The lima goes to a diagonal for varieties of reason. Again, we sometimes send those patients to surgery thinking that should be bypassed, but maybe this lima has a very in, uh, in, intramyocardial course, but you can see that there is very late filling of this. So we fix that patient. And when we fix this patient, this is the angiogram, but while you look at angiogram, I want to write, read the notes from EPIC. About three weeks ago, he underwent successful PCI with three stents deploying the LED. Since the procedure, he has been able to walk, increase his physical activity. He says he feels much better, almost close to how he felt 15 years ago. He has not used sublingual nitroglycerin. There are no complaints of palpitations, near syncope or syncope. He has not needed long-acting nitrates or Ranexa. The patient has been doing well during cardiac rehab without chest pain or dyspnea, during activities of treadmill exercise or biking. So there are final slide which shows me I want to share seven points today. One is technical success of CTO PCI is improved with experienced operators. Our center can boast this data. We are part of this national registry called Progress CTO which validates our data. Second, FFR confirms that persistent ischemia and CTO segment in spite of collateral which appear adequate. So do not be fooled by those collateral filling. Third, presence of CTO in a non-infarct artery during an MI is associated with high mortality. Now this is an interesting statement because a lot of times you will fix that LED and leave that RCSCT alone. But remember, if it's a 55-year-old guy, at some point, he or she is gonna have a recurrent event in that LED. I mean, if you, if you do not optimize all the conduits, maybe, maybe you are being unfair to that patient. CTOPCI, number four, CTOPCI is shown to improve symptoms reduce ischemia and improve LV function. There is no debate about these three outcomes. Number five, when successful CTOPCI allows for complete revascularization while avoiding coronary artery bypass surgery. Number six, when successful CTOPCI allows for complete revascularization while avoiding cabbage. Number seven, while successful CTOPCI allows for your, I'm just trying to belabor that point because I think one should consider CTOPCI as an option to SVG bypass. Obviously, convincing proof of survival benefit from CTOPCI remains elusive, and but but before proceeding with revascularization, however, it is important to fully understand the burden of symptoms, risk attributable to CTO, as well as possible benefits of optimal medical therapy. Thank you all very much. Sit down, ladies, don't leave. Uh, so now you know why I said uh, Alpesh was once my fellow, now he's my teacher. So a lecture with amazing content, but amazing organization too. So uh, if I had a hat, it would be off to you. That was amazing. So uh, while people are getting up the courage to ask questions, don't give it to a heart failure guy. Um, let me put you on the spot for two things. First of all, uh, I'm, I'd like you to tell us what you think and how many cases, what kind of training it takes to become uh, a quality CTO operator. And number two, you showed us lots of data uh, indicating that uh, there's a tremendous risk associated with uh, a CTO. Uh, and you showed us very interestingly that, that no CTO is adequately collateralized. How much of that's modifiable? And if much of that's modifiable, why haven't we seen that in the two randomized trials? Um, yeah, well, so the, I'll start with the second question first. Um, it, it is really hard to, um, 
modify the amount of risk we expose our patient during CT or PCI. Because it is such a CTO-based, operator-based uh, risk uh, assessment. For example, the more complex the CTOs, the more higher technology we're going to use, such as retrograde reentry, um, such as anti-grade wire reentry. And all those techniques are associated with more complications. So I, I would probably put it simply in two forms. One is to improve our complication event rates. Pre-procedural planning is going to be very helpful. I think the coronary CTA integration in understanding the architecture of the vessel better is going to be very helpful. We need to have better understanding about which technique to use because the more complex the technique we're going to use, the more likely we're going to have perforations, need for emergency bypass surgery. So I think to better assess that, select the right CTOs, and that takes me to the next part of your question, as to one of the fundamental ways to improve outcomes or make it safer is to better train. I do not know what is a precise number to be exact, but there are two basic requirements, I believe, to have a good set CTO program. For, for a CTO expert in a good expert center, I would believe that somewhere in the proximity of 75 to 80 PCI, CTO PCI cases ought to be very helpful. And we have seen that in our data, actually one of the slides I showed you, where the event rates are very comparable. The success rates goes above 80%, the MACE rates go below 1% in, during the hospitalization. The second thing I would suggest is have those operators um, not only have 80, 80 cases a year, but let them make sure that they are training retrograde techniques. Because if you have a CTO program and if you're not comfortable doing retrograde PCIs, your success rates will uh, not get over 50 to 60 percent. So that will really not help the program. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Uh, two questions. The first one uh, that the saphenous venous graft patency, was that for CTO specifically or for all comers? And then uh, the second question is, if you have some, how much relative stock do you put in viability versus ischemia? So for example, if you had a patient that had a CTO with good collateralization, had complete viability, but no ischemic burden on, on stress testing, in a patient that was in two scenarios, one asymptomatic, one symptomatic, would you consider them good candidates for CTO? So these are real world questions. Uh, first of all, to, to answer that, those are all CTO uh, patients who underwent uh, bypass surgery and they had a re uh, planned uh, MSCT or uh, CTA at one year. Um, I think both are important, viability as well as ischemia. But I think viability, I would personally say, is more important in deciding if that CTO ought to be revascularized. Doesn't matter how you choose it or whether you would consider medical therapy, the decision to which therapy you offer is multi-level decision. I mean, in other words, how comfortable your PCI operator is doing those cases, the anatomical nuances, how comfortable is the patient going through a procedure, and more importantly, how symptomatic that patient really is. But if the patient is symptomatic, as you asked, and has a viable myocardium, that myocardium is most likely hibernating. You know, if you extrapolate some of the data from the STITCHES trial, the 10-year trial, viability studies, uh, ischemia studies, were not so great at predicting who's going to do really so great. So that being said, I think viability of a myocardium with an underperfuse area because of a CTO, in my books, is a, would be a good candidate, assuming the patient and the anatomy is right for PCIs or even bypass surgery. But those territories ought to be revascularized because one thing is to be passive. You know, patient will be fine with medical therapy, medical therapy, unless something happens where the other artery shuts down. And as, you, as I showed you, when the other artery shut down, your mortality rate goes significantly high. Cardiogenic shock goes significantly high. So one can make a strong argument of viability, ischemia, and symptom-based revascularization approach, if PCI, if anatomically suitable. Alpesh, that was a terrific talk, and I think one of the things you did so well is that as we sit here and think of cri criticism of opening CTOs, you 
preempted any of these with your with your uh, data. Uh, just a question, or at least a comment. The uh, CTO is probably one of the few remaining uncharted, or at least only partially charted, areas in interventional cardiology, and it's probably the single main reason patients are sent for surgery rather than in, an interventional uh, procedure. One question, average time that it takes to do a procedure, and two, because there's more dye and more radiation, do you have any data on uh, renal failure, renal function, or radiation effects in patients who uh, uh, CTO procedures are, are performed on? Yeah, uh, th thank you for those comments. And yeah, to answer your question, um, there is definitely more uh, uh, dye and radiation uh, involved. Um, it, again, it depends on which technique of CTO-PCI we are using. We never do uh, ad hoc CTO-PCIs. We always bring those patients back because it requires a lot of pre-procedure planning. More than often, we do do IV hydration. CTO cases can, like the one I showed you last week I did, was maybe a 15-minute case. Um, two, three wire escalations, and we are done. We use maybe 100 cc of contrast. But that's not the typical uh, scenario. In all the data we have, OpenCTO has collected data. The amount of dye exposure is about uh, 1.5 times higher than the routine PCI. But again, this was a historical control. They compared it with it. And radiation exposure was almost twice as what we get on routine PCIs. So those are clearly uh, factors. And the more complex the JCTO score is, the more retrograde approaches you use, the higher those issues uh, become. Um, so we, uh, skin uh, burns, for example, has to be monitored. Um, there have been a couple of cases where I've worked for two, three, four hours and have had to stop because the, the monitor says now it's five grays. So that does happen to us. So, but newer technology, like for example, even the CTA integration, so we can basically road map it. But equally important is like Simmons has this low CTO settings, which is brand new in our cath lab. And now we have made it routine for all our cases, CTO or non-CTO, to use that as the format. So we are learning to do better job at reducing dye and, and, and radiation exposure. But it is, it is challenging work. So sometimes it can be half an hour. Uh, sometimes it could be five, four hours. But I would say average time is about 60 minutes. Uh, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, as an imager, it's uh, actually easy to follow along with, with uh, uh, what you were saying. The one question I've got, I guess, is, is we move into this kind of new healthcare economic climate. One of the things clearly it seems like is it requires a lot of pre-procedural testing and, and workup. And then it looks like you have a lot of toys that you can use during the procedure itself. Has anybody looked at kind of the cost per unit of quality of life improvement or something? Because in the future, I think that's, I mean, ultimately it's not gonna be just that we can do it and we can provide yeah. a benefit, but that we can provide a cost-effective benefit. Uh, thank you, Deepin. That, that would be an amazing undertaking. I, nobody really knows that. You, you're asking a very huge health economics question. And just like valvular heart disease, which have a very similar uh, efforts, uh, finances involved and quality of life issues, I think CTO would be another thing because those patients, like as I kept on saying, like a bad back or a bad knee, they've been suffering for many years. A true CTO patients are often considered themselves disabled. They suffer from depression. They get short of breath climbing two flights of stairs. They make changes in their vocation, in their profession. So that being said and done, we don't truly know the impact of it. There is a lot of pre-procedure planning. There have been published data on what CTO does to the cath lab economics. For example, we know that in a case by case, when you compare to a routine PCI, you are using more specialized devices, wires, catheters. So there is more cost involved up front during the day in the cath lab. But beyond that, when you compare that to an open heart surgery, maybe it's not as bad. But we truly do not know the impact of healthcare economics. And that would be fantastic because CTO is a life restricting disease, unlike a non STEMI or a STEMI without, without an LV dysfunction.
Thank you all.